When in doubt, exploit your cat. This is Johnny, Johnny Utah. Where to begin? Hi, my name is Cerulea and I am a knitter. If we've never met, I am a retired former knitwear designer. I used to work with yarn companies and I would help them with anything from product development to social media to pattern design. Um, I've sort of done a little bit of everything in the knitwear industry. And then in about 2015, I just left. So just before I left knitting, and I didn't do it in like a dramatic fashion, what I did was I sort of hopped industries. Um, but I, I wrote a book before I left. It's this book here. It's, this was, I think, printed in 2014, maybe 2015, but uh, it's called Magpies, Homebodies, and Nomads, and you can still find it today. I just saw it in a yarn store in Truckee, California, which was a great surprise. Um, I'm really proud of how it turned out. Uh, it feels like another lifetime. Uh, these photos and these designs, some of these samples, I'm not even sure where they are. I don't know where this sweater is, um, and I would love to have it back. Uh, I might have to re-knit that, but yeah, it, it represents a time, kind of a culmination of my time working, like I said, as a professional uh, knitter, knitwear designer, product developer, kind of jack jill of all trades. A lot of this book has to do with style and finding your personal style and then kind of knitting according to that. Um, it has to do with planning projects and even it dabbles a little bit in getting into knitwear design. So this book was published in 2014 and shortly after that I sort of, uh, I wouldn't say it was a dramatic like exit from the industry, I just sort of tiptoed away and into something else. Um, that's something else being working for uh, e-commerce and Currently, I'm working as a content strategist at IMDb. Um, so yeah, basically, knitting fell by the wayside. Not only uh, the, the professional design part of it, but even freelance design uh, is really time consuming. And to be honest, it was always a huge stressor on me. Um, so I just sort of let it fall away. Uh, it It's something that I realized in the time that I spent being a professional knitter, which is, don't get me wrong, a dream job, but often what happens when you get your dream jobs is that you lose that hobby that, you know, it started as a hobby, it became your job, it became your entire life, and then you kind of lose sight of what brought you to it in the first place and how you used to enjoy it in a selfish way, like just for yourself uh, or your friends and family. Um, I was making for a huge audience and not myself. Um, so yeah, I, I've done a little here and there. I think I've posted projects on Instagram, um, but they've always sort of, you know, the, the nature of Instagram stories in particular, things would just kind of fade away uh, within 24 hours and uh, you can save highlights, but it just never felt like an actual document of a project, which is something that I've really been missing. So I'm hoping that this can be that. One of the alternate titles of this book was Brigalore Knits, and there was concern at the time that that would be something that was a little too esoteric. Um, it's a French word, and it's definitely a little pretentious. <laughs> it, came, it came out of uh, cultural studies. I, I was a graduate student at one point. I'll just read you a little blurb from the intro. Uh, I first came across the term bricolage in a university classroom where I was assigned to read Subculture, the Meaning of Style by Dick Hebdige, a British, so British sociologist. I was floored to learn that the study of style existed, and even more floored to learn that Hebdige seemed to describe something I was observing everywhere. Writing 21 years before the turn of the millennium, he hinted that the only way left to achieve originality was through the mixture of cultural reference. I agreed and later came to realize that this is a theory uniquely suited to modern knitters and knitwear designers. So, you know, this was 10 years ago and I was just kind of marveling at the fact that there's like a proliferation of knitters and knitwear designers uh, and that we're all working from the same source books. So we're all working with the knit stitch, the purl stitch, uh, and you know, not much else seemingly, but uh, just like music, there's infinite combinations and what I really find uh, sort of joy and beauty in is figuring out ways to innovate in that very limited space. So I think, you know, without the param the restrictions and parameters of designing for a season or a certain customer or marketplace uh, or even like theme for a, an open call for submissions. I sort of lost sight of what I wanted to make for myself, which is why I haven't really been knitting for myself in a way that's meaningful or worth sharing. So that started to feel really bad. Um, 
and I ended up doing something called the artist's way. <laughs> So the artist way is something that I learned about uh, from people who work in the entertainment industry. I had heard about it. Uh, it's something that they use for to get rid of writer's block or overcome fears around performing. Um, and for myself, I just wanted to get back in touch with uh, something that I knew was very creative inside of me that had just been tamped down either from you know, a sense of failure, either, you know, missed deadlines or designs that didn't come out exactly how I wanted them to. Um, things like that, being too busy to sort of devote time or make time for things that I really wanted to work on. So The Artist's Way, this is the journal, and it's for the morning pages, which are a key part of the program. Uh, you can also do the read the book. It's a 12-week um, sort of chapter-by-chapter -chapter program, and honestly, it, the big takeaway for me so far, I'm not fully done. I stalled out around week 10 and I need to get back to it, um, but it is basically kind of tough love telling you to uh, that you are your own worst enemy, you're your own worst critic, you know, you're, you're, it's so easy to talk yourself out of doing things when really you could be making progress and improvements just by getting in there, getting messy and doing things, and that's kind of what I needed to hear. Um, you know, the self-doubt comes from perfectionism a lot of the time, for me at least. Um, you know, I'll, I'll hesitate or, or put off doing things because I am afraid. There are two other parts of the program. One of them is a weekly artist date, which I feel like is not terribly difficult for me to do. It's something I already do, you know, in my normal life, which is spend an hour or two every week doing something by yourself, going and just feeding your inner, like, inspiration needs. Um, it could be something like walking in a forest or uh, going to browse a library or a gallery or things, something like that, shopping for art supplies, um, just something that indulges uh, the creative part of you and recharges you and you can't, the rule is that you can't share it with anyone else, which is really, you know, it kind of increases that focus um, and that feeling of maybe uncomfort, discomfort, uncomfort, discomfort. <laughs> The other thing is you have to wake up every morning and write in these morning pages, three pages. Uh, I tend to set a timer for 30 minutes and see how far I get, usually two and a half pages. These are large pages and they're narrow, very narrow rule. Um, there's no rules around it. I mean, I think the, the most important thing is that you do it every morning and you um, you don't have to write about anything in particular. You're supposed to free write and just get whatever is in your head out onto the page. And the thinking is that it will clear you for the rest of the day to sort of focus on your actual work um, and whether that's creative or, or work work. Um, it just clears the slate, which is really lovely. Um, I did find that it did that. She also gives you prompts um, if you want to dive deeper into some of the weekly subjects. Uh, but yeah, I mean... It is hard, I mean, <laughs> for someone who's a texter and a typer, like actually handwriting is physically difficult. It's funny, I would get these cramps uh, from like probably lack of use of those muscles writing. So that was really interesting in the beginning that it was physically painful. Then it became sort of tedious. Uh, it's, it's really hard to sit and do something in the morning when you wanna be either starting your day or hitting the snooze button. Um, so the discipline, I think that's another big takeaway. <laughs> I can, do, I can do a whole video about the artist way and, and what I got out of it, but um, the discipline and just setting time aside, it's amazing what you can get done in just 30 minutes. That's, that's something I really learned was that, um, you know, I started to think through what do I want to do to get over this like big creative block and this channel kind of came out of that, this idea, um, as well as plans for, you know, another few videos and beyond. Um, I did a lot of thinking and sort of what we call, what I call in my day job as a, com a content strategist, a competitive analysis or a competitive audit of what else is out there. Um, and I didn't exactly find the thing that I want to be doing, which is uh, looking at nits on screen. So a little bit more about that. So through the practice of doing morning pages, I spent a lot of time thinking about how do I want to re-enter this world of knitting, um, both for myself and, and also like as a participant in the community and a presence on YouTube. And the thing that I kind of kept circling around was 
knits on screen. Um, I'm obsessed with costuming and, and production design and set design uh, to sometimes the detriment of me actually following or understanding plots. <laughs> so uh, I'm slightly ashamed of that. But um, if something is described as visually stunning or sumptuous or a feast for the eyes, like that's probably going to rank pretty high on my list of things that I want to see. So um, I haven't been able to find another YouTuber who can who actually digests all of that costuming i found costuming channels but they're looking at everything and i'm more interested i'm, I'm interested in it all but uh i'm always particularly interested in the knitwear so and textiles specific so um i think that there is sort of a an open field for that Something that really got me through the pandemic was watching historical costuming videos on YouTube. So that is a community that has sort of lurked and um, I did a little, uh, I, I cut and started to sew a linen shift for myself and I have supplies to make some stays and uh, also a kirtle. So I kind of got started and then, you know, pandemic depression set in or something i just set it aside we ended up moving that was a big ordeal uh, i switched jobs like a lot distracted me from finishing those projects which i you know hopefully will get back to um but yeah the historical costuming community is really inspiring um I do consider the idea of like participating in local uh, society for creative anachronism, um, things like that. And the projects that appeal to me right now are very simple. So, I mean, simple in <laughs> construction and ornamentation, but not necessarily in like skill level. Uh, I like Viking Age and kind of early medieval. So that's why I went for the kirtle. Um, it's also a lot of hand sewing, at least the projects I was tackling. Uh, that appeals to me as well, just because it's close to knitting, it's portable, you know, it's something you can sit there and do while, while watching something. Um, and yeah, it, it felt a little more manageable to, to me than actually using a sewing machine. So hopefully I'll get back to that. But yeah, I mean, just watching those folks document their process and talk about, you know, shared sharing what they learned, um, resources that you people might not know about, uh, how materials behaved. It just made me miss doing that for knitting, which, um, yeah, I, I, this is why I'm here. <laughs> I want to do more of it. So as you can see, I mean, books are very important to me. I am not above a self-help book when I feel stuck. And, you know, I, I am very proud of the book that I, I created, even though, um, you know, like I said, I, I published the book and then pieced out of the knitting world. Um, but, you know, I still have a massive collection. I have a little library in my neighborhood. I have a lot of them. Um, and the other day I found a what looked like a review copy or a galley copy of um, Pris Priscilla Gibson Roberts' um, Knitting in the Old Way, I believe is the title. And... It's full of Gansies and Lopa Pesas and uh, just instruction on how to do all sorts of folk knitting, cowichan sweaters. It's fantastic and that sort of knitting really, really appeals to me. Um, so I felt really like the gods were talking to me. Like uh, I also wondered if she lives in the neighborhood. I think she was a Pacific Northwest based uh, designer. Um, but yeah, book reports are something that I would be happy to share. I know that there's an active like book talk community on TikTok, booktube, it's a whole thing. For me, you know, I'm not a great reader. I'm sorry to say I do a lot of Audible. Uh, I'm not really into fiction. Again, sorry to say I prefer nonfiction. Uh, but I have a lot of knitting books and I would love to share the ones that work for me and that are meaningful and also check out like what's out there. I, I always kind of do a drive-by when I'm in a bookstore or library to see what's been published in the knitting world recently. Um, but I don't know what people are loving, what are the new, you know, tomes that everyone loves and follows. Um, I also may resuscitate a project uh, I had done for Zalana Yarns, which was e the um, Rhea and June project. So it was basically borrowing the idea of Julie and Julia uh, and the joy, was it not the joy of cooking, mastering the art of French cooking, where the author cooks her way through Julia Child's book. Um, I was trying to work my way through June Hemmons Hyatt's Hemin Hi book. <laughs> Sorry if I messed that up. Uh, the Principles of Knitting. So it's a massive 
you know, volume and I was just going chapter by chapter and if there was something about fiber, I was kind of exploring that fiber. If there was a, a technique or way of knitting that I hadn't tried before, I'd swatch or show it on camera. So um, yeah, I might dip back into that because it's just like, it's massive and it's so valuable and um, it's like the Bible as far as I'm concerned. Another area that I think could be interesting to explore is my approach to design, not necessarily uh, with the intent of getting back into design. Uh, I, I don't really have any intention of doing that right now other than my own projects, but I think I could share kind of blueprints on how I think through a pattern, how I reverse engineer from a photo, um, how I go about kind of planning a project for myself. And I do have one garment in particular that I've been kind of mulling over. Um, and yeah, I won't reveal just yet what it is. I wouldn't call myself a Swifty, but it might be Taylor Swift related. Um, so yeah, stay tuned for that. And, you know, speaking of history, I think I have a personal history that I would like to dive back into. And now that I have some distance from the body of work that I left behind, kind of when I walked away from knitting, there are bits and pieces that I would like to pick back up and themes um, that I want to explore. There are actually full pattern books that I have like in my Google Drive just uh, concepted. Uh, I have got uh, folders full of what I call swipe or what's called swipe, you know, just collections of inspiration images. I've got Pinterest boards, you know, uh, my, my saved file and in Instagram. Like there's a lot there that has just been simmering below the surface. Um, I also have a pretty formidable stash. Uh, I did have a moth infestation at my last house. Uh, I had been ho holding on. I almost said hoarding. Did you hear that Freudian slip? I mean, I think I was hoarding, but I had been holding on to all this yarn from my past. Uh, it had a lot of sentimental value because a lot of it was stuff that I had worked on. So I had kind of put my ideas and thoughts into its development and had these cones of sample yarn or unlabeled balls and um, they were one of a kind. It was either something that we decided not to take on and produce or we would um, change it before it actually went to market and we just got to keep kind of the leftovers and I couldn't get rid of it. I mean it was too special to me um, and of course I just always thought one day what if you know I'll, I'll need this. Um, but the moths decided for me and everything in my basement pretty much had to be thrown away. Uh, I know there's ways to get rid of moths, but it was just such a volume that I, I couldn't even fathom doing it. Um, and frankly, I did need to kind of trim down. So what I was left with was what was in my house upstairs, not in the basement. And um, it's still a lot of yarn. So I don't really see myself going out and buying uh, the latest things. Like it's funny, I don't even really know what's out there right now. I do want to share something that I have been working on that I'm very close to finishing. I can't believe how long this has taken me considering I used to knit on deadlines and everything. Um, this is a baby romper. It's actually more of a toddler romper. It's the Pearl Soho uh, pinwheel pinwheel romper, I believe it's called. Um, I'll link it down in the description box. Um, I still need to do some I-cord edging to create the little ties and finish the armholes. Uh, I'm also going to do some embroidery up at the top here. It definitely has the feeling of the Elizabeth Zimmerman baby surprise jacket where it's kind of blobby and you're like, I don't know if this is cute or not or if it's actually going to form something. Um, but it's, you know, it was fun to knit. Uh, and like I said, it took me longer than I thought. Um, the kit, the finishing was a little bit, I would say, intermediate advanced. So this is Kitchener Stitch in the, the crotch gusset, which has never been my fave. Um, but I do like how it looks. So this is also one by one. I don't know if this is going to focus. It is um, one by one sewn bind off for the leg holes. This is something where I'm really like, is this going to fit a one and a half year old? This seems like an almost like an adult leg <laughs> size, but you never know with babies. They're like chunky and unexpected areas. Um, so yeah, it looks really nice and neat. It's very rounded and polished and professional looking. Uh, it is finicky to do. It was in the round and you have to split 
So you slip the knit stitches to one needle and then the purl stitches to another and then you do Kitchener between two circular needles. And of course, I didn't have exactly the right circumference so I was using like magic loop and like readjusting and there's a few areas where you can totally tell that I was like white knuckle knitting and just hoping that things would not like fly off the needles, slide off the needles before I was like had everything secure. Um, so yeah, it's not my finest work but it's getting me back into the swing of the full like range of a project uh, from conception to like finishing it you know the best way you possibly can and then hopefully giving it to someone who's gonna look very adorable in it. So it is a little intimidating to come back after a long break and realize like I don't really know what's up in the knitting space anymore. Um, that's not entirely true. I still follow it, you know, a decent amount, and I'm always drawn to sort of um, photos of knitting online and things like that. Um, I definitely think my tastes have leaned towards the utilitarian or practical and things that are still rooted in history. You know, I'm really drawn to folkwear always and things that are gonna get worn and used and uh, aren't necessarily super decorative. Uh, at the same time, I really love things that are exaggerated and outsized. I love the trend of massive sleeves and uh, bobbles. I've always loved a bobble. Um, so I'm looking to kind of figure out what my style is and what I will have to say. Um, I think some of the things that I used to be known for are... Um, I knitted a lot of dresses, which is kind of weird, and at the time not a lot of people were knitting dresses. It's a lot of knitting, and I think I was uh, maybe taking advantage of the fact that I never had to knit those. I mean, not sometimes I did, but uh, they were always knit by other knitters, so I could, I could be extravagant, and uh, that was fun. It always made for a great photo shoot. Um, but yeah, is that practical anymore? Would I knit a dress for myself? I sort of want to. Um, <laughs> yeah, I did that. What else was I into? I was always into finishing details. I think I inherited that from Nora, my boss, Nora Gone, who is now the editor of Vogue Knitting, I believe, still. Um, she's, yeah, fantastic, a huge mentor to me, an inspiration, and really came from the world of I think she had originally kind of uh, been working alongside Deborah Newton, who has written some of the best finishing books you can find. Um, and so she would do things like, you know, at the time when I got into knitwear design, um, it was all about knitting in the round and eliminating seams, uh, things that you could do with minimal finishing uh, to cut down on that work because people really didn't like it. And it was it was often a, like a point in the project when things could massively go off the rails and you could have that like sloppy, ill-fitting look if you didn't do it right. So um, Nora would do things like the thing that really sticks in my head is the sewn on button band. So she would do that and uh, I sort of just picked that up after working alongside her for so long to kind of take care in that final step and almost finishing should almost take as long as the knitting of the pieces took. Um, that was, I think it was something she said or maybe I just picked it up from somewhere else and attributed it to her but um, maybe it was Maggie Rigetti who's another favorite of mine. Uh, but yeah, I still believe that today and um, yeah, I'm looking forward to sort of are there finishing techniques that I haven't tried yet that I can learn? Um, yeah, I, I, don't, I don't know. I don't know. It's, a, it's gonna be a journey. <laughs> Whew, okay, well, this has been interesting. Uh, I feel like I've gotten a lot off my chest and there's probably a lot more to say. Um, I do, like I said, have two video ideas um, that I have in the hopper and I'm sure more will come. Um, one of the best parts about doing stuff like this is that you know, you start to look at your life through the lens of ideas for videos or posts or designs and I really have missed that. So um, thank you for watching. I hope this isn't too rambly. Apologies for audio or video quality issues. I am still learning in that realm as well. Um, I've been out of practice and I'm ready to get back in. See you soon. Bye.